again. This is Jeff Grandy with uh, Journey with Jeff. We are back for our second interview with uh, Gisela Adamski. Uh, Gisela, thank you for being here again, and we're going to continue from where we left off last time. Last time we talked, you talked. You were mentioning you were in Auschwitz in 1944. October 1944. And you had been separated from your mother, and uh, as far as you know, that your mother had been killed. She'd been right. killed. And you were now, no, your father was gone, your mother was gone. Yeah, but I did not think my father was dead. Oh, For didn't... some reason, I was so sure he was alive. I knew they had taken him. I did not know where they had taken him. I figured by the time that we arrived in Auschwitz that maybe, just maybe, they took him to Auschwitz also. But still, he was healthy and resourceful, and I did not think until I came, till a few months after the war, when he didn't show up, that he was dead. Well, at this point, in 1944 at Auschwitz, you found yourself alone. You were alone by this time. All you alone. alone. All alone. And what happened? Um, we know what happened in uh, April of 1945, when the Russian army came and yeah, took out the, the, the Nazis. That period between 44 and uh, 45, the last six or eight months. Right. What was? What, what did you do? What happened? Okay, I was. As I said, in Auschwitz, I was there six days. Six days that to this day seem like 60 years. And they did not assign us bunks. We never really went to sleep. We slept maybe sitting up or standing up because they had us in rooms. They chased us in. We were hundreds of women. They ch chased us in and out of the building they kept us in and it was cold and the clothes that they had given us was flimsy it was hardly anything i remember the coat that they gave me had some torn lining i tore out that lining and put it on my bald head because i was so terribly cold anyhow that went on six days they only fed us once and Thinking back, we were so unbelievably hungry, and they gave us one bowl for four people and no spoons or anything. I had kept a toothbrush for some reason in my dumb mind. I thought you couldn't live without brushing your teeth. And I had hidden the toothbrush in my wooden shoes. Would they have found it? They would have killed me because we weren't allowed to have anything. We didn't, I didn't have a pin to my name, but I had a toothbrush. I was able to use the, the uh, handle of the toothbrush to pull out something from the soup. Not very much. So that was the only time they really fed us. But after six days, they called out, out some numbers. The numbers that they had given us were sewn onto our coats. So I was number eight something. I don't remember the number. I didn't keep the coat either. Um, and we were put on a train. We were given some uh, um, bread and we were given some salami that looked to me like it was made out of human beings. It was so unbelievably red. As hungry as I was, I did not eat that, but I devoured the bread. And now we were on a train, it, I believe it was a day, and they couldn't always, they probably didn't have enough rails to handle all these trains between the troops and the, the Jews that they were transporting. So we were put on hold and we were waiting. We waited in the station of my hometown, Oppen, for a while. And as I was looking out, I thought to myself, my God, what happened to me in the, the, those few years that I was gone from there? 
But we went on and we went to a place called Kurzbach. They got us out of the trains and we were marched into a camp. The town was Kurzbach, the camp was called Kurzbach. And they had two, two um, um, wooden barracks there. And we were put in by that time. We were, as far as I knew, 1,000 people. The other day on the computer, I found that transport. It was number ES, like Sam. On the computer, it says there was 1,500 people, and only 76 survived from that. So I'm one of either 1,500 or 1,000 that survived. So the arts to survive all this were incredible, but somehow I did. But what kept me going was I thought my father was alive, and I was going to tell him. It is hard to say uh, that I did whatever I could for my mother, and I couldn't do anymore. That they just didn't let me. I think that really was the reason for me surviving. Right. Well, that's very beyond sad. That's a t t t such a a tragic, horrendous thing to happen to 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 for to experience that and 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 the anyhow in that camp again there were wooden bunks and I was lucky in a way I the first day we arrived there I was sitting in a corner crying and two girls came over and. They wanted to know why I was crying, and I again told them that I was separated from my mother a few days ago. And there were two sisters, and they kind of adopted me as a third sister, and told me instead of being on my bunk to come, they were on the second tier bunk, and stay with them, and we were three people on two bunks, and we kept warmer that way. And we had three blankets, so it made it a little bit better. Now, we only had the clothes that they did, the, the rags that they really, that they gave us in Auschwitz. We had no change of clothes. We were there three and a half months. We never bathed. We never changed clothes. We worked in the clothes. We slept in the clothes and went out again the next morning. Even so, at times we got wet because it was snowing. And we had, how we survived, how we didn't, I don't know. Now you get a little bit uh, of a draft and you get a cold. But you, were, you, you saw people all around you, surrounding you, who were not, did not survive that. That's right. Some died. A lot of sickness, a lot of death. A lot of sickness. We ha hardly got any food. Uh, we got a piece of bread in the morning. That piece of bread we ate, while, when they gave it to us, we ate it. We never put it down because somebody would take it. it uh, people were so hungry, they didn't care. Beside the, the horrible the living conditions and being deprived, of so much, uh, did you see? Did you see any evidence or any uh, uh, instances of physical, actual physical abuse or sexual abuse? For that? No, there was no sexual. Thank God, there was no sexual abuse, as far as I was concerned, from the Germans. Ever. The Russians was another story, but the uh, the Germans. Uh, didn't, and I didn't see anybody else being they abused. Push and beat and yeah, they beat up. us. They beat us for no reason. Walking to work, we had two, uh, two. Um, I think they were, they were army actually. 
older guys that took us to work, they weren't even afraid of us anymore. We were so with skeletons walking around. And they had rifles, these long rifles. They beat us with those rifles. They just walked by and they went like this. So for no good reason, they, they beat us. There's a little anecdote that I want to mention. Now, we never were allowed to speak to them, or there was really no reason to speak to them. But one day, I don't know what made me, I was working and I heard these guys talking and I heard that the one guy was from the town next to Oppeln, from where I came from. And I got the courage together and I said to him, Oh, you are from Oppen, uh, from uh, Hindenburg. I'm from Oppen. And he said to me, you are German? And I said, yes. He says, oh, I thought you were all foreigners. So they didn't even tell the, the guards who we were. They thought we were foreigners. And the Germans don't like foreigners. I mean, they don't like Jews, number one, but number two is foreigners. So that was, he never hit me again, though, after that. And now it's getting its, 1945 is coming along now. No, not yet. We, they um, evacuated that particular camp the end of January 1945. They took us what was called on the death march. Again, they gave us a piece of bread. And we were marching. We did maybe 35 miles a day. And we had nothing to drink. After that, we never got bread again. And we never rationed ourselves. Whenever we got something, we ate it. Um, at night, we slept outdoors in the winter in January in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. It's cold. I, I remember one night, actually in the morning, waking up and not being able to move. I was frozen and I was yelling, I'm dead, I'm dead, <laughs> because I couldn't move. So whoever survived this, I should mention that before we left the camp, they asked for volunteers to stay behind. Um, they asked who uh, knew how to uh, work in, like in gardens. I had worked in in, uh, in the fields, but I didn't volunteer. I found out later that the girls that stayed behind when we left had to bury the people that they shot because they shot everybody that couldn't move. As far as I knew, from the thousand people that had gotten there. Only 600 left three months later, for three and a half months. So the others were either died by themselves or were shot towards the end. The girls that stayed behind uh, caught up with us. Now, I walked with them for four days. On the fifth day, when we were being counted in the morning, we stayed in some kind of a, uh, um, it was a school for delinquent children, and we finally slept in a barn that was a little bit uh, warmer. When we came out and lined up, there was a Polish man standing there, a Christian, and he said to the two sisters and myself, they, uh, don't go with them. They, they're not, they're making believe, they're not really counting. The Russians are close by, and we could hear shooting. And he says, don't go, go back in the barn and hide, and don't come out. So we did that. And sure enough, they left. They didn't look around if anybody had stayed behind. The next morning, we smelled smoke. They had set timers. They must have known that some people stayed behind. They had set timers, and the whole 
place started burning, all those barns started burning. We came out, there were uh, altogether 45 of us there. That man had saved 45 people that day. Did you ever see the, the two sisters who, had, who adopted you, did you ever see them again? No, I didn't. We eventually, after we were there for three months, the Russians came in. And um, the Russians came in three days after we stayed behind. Now, in those three days, we had to eat, we, had, we wanted clothes. We broke into the German apartments surrounding. There was a Dutch girl and I, we took an axe. We broke into the doors, the wooden doors. We helped ourselves to whatever we could find. And we had to feed the other people that were really sick and couldn't fend for themselves. Well, the, now that the Germans are, have basically left and been defeated, the Russian army comes in. Right. Did you feel, at that point, were you feeling safer? Uh, thinking that, Not like, really. Did you feel like you were being rescued and that these were no. people? Why not? The first night they came in, they broke into the room where we were. Now they knew we were there because when the Russians came in, we were on the street welcoming them. How they knew, how they came, if somebody invited them to come up. But I remember one or two Russians coming into the room where we were staying now. We all stayed together. Being it was a school, they also had bunk beds, but it was indoors. And uh, we had a Polish girl amongst us. Most of us were German and uh, Dutch, and we had a few Belgian girls with us. This one Polish girl probably must have been in a camp where she encountered the Russians, and she uh, warned us to close the door with, they had like a, a big board that they put under the door, door handle so nobody could get in from the outside. Anyhow, they came in and they raped seven girls that night. It was pitch dark, I don't even know how they got around. Maybe they had cigarette lighters or whatever. I was sleeping, I never heard anybody even come in. They must have breaking in a door, it's noisy. Well, so you... So we were deadly afraid of them. So how long after that were you able to um, be, back, be back with, uh, with, with people who were going to take care of you and you, you ultimately uh, came to the United States. Uh, what happened right after that? How did you get from there to, to the United States? Okay. Um, uh, I was there under Russian occupation, um, but it was pretty normal towards the end, until the end of the war on May, May 7th, 1945, at which point a Russian Jewish soldier drove me home because I wasn't very far from home. One of the girls that I was with came with me home. Now I figured I get home, my father is going to be there and everything is going to look up. But it wasn't so. My father never came back. I found out much later that he was uh, killed in, in Dachau. Um, I stayed in my hometown for a year. As it happened, I was with that one girl and we didn't have what to eat. We went out in the field to pick some potatoes. Somebody gave us some flour and some salt and we cooked soup from those bad potatoes, the potatoes that are being planted. They're, they're, really not uh, good to eat, but 
we did, we made soup from it. Eventually the Polish army and the Russian command came in to town. I happened to be also from a garrison town, up in was, part of it was garrison. And um, there were some, Rus uh, some Jewish so uh, soldiers and one approached us if we knew how to cook. And we said yes, and of course we didn't, but eventually somebody showed us. And they gave us provision and we cooked and we ate and uh, things started to look up a little bit. Um, about t two months later, now we were in May 45, by actually August 45, a Jewish um, officer came to the door and said he was Jewish and said that somebody told him there were two Jewish girls living there and he wanted to introduce himself. And he came in, I ended up marrying him in October. So I knew him from August to October. And we stayed in Oppen. He left the army. He, um, got a discharge, I believe it was maybe January, February. And in uh, May we left. I had gotten in touch with some relatives in Paris, and they got in touch with relatives in Chicago. And the, my uncle from Chicago sent papers to immigrate to the United States for my husband and myself. Now we went to France in August 19, I think it was August, 1946, and waited to be able to come to the United States, but they had uh, closed the quota for people from behind the Iron Curtain. My husband was from Poland. And being in France, I didn't work there, but I had my daughter there. She was born in 47. Uh, my husband was a tailor. He worked. He had working papers, but we had to show up at the police station every three months to show that we are there because we were on transit visa. Eventually I couldn't take it anymore, was afraid of everybody in uniform. And we decided to go to Israel. We were in Israel for seven years. Again, my husband worked as a tailor and I didn't work. I worked part-time a little bit for some factory, but there wasn't much. And uh, we got back in touch with the uh, consulate. We got um, our papers came through on the German quota. And we were able to immigrate in um, 1956. We came here in May 1956. So you're 56, you've been here ever since then? Yes. You came with your husband, with your little girl, Elaine? Right. Yes. And, um, uh, you apparently were able to to adopt this as your your home and, right. and have. I wanted to, I want to ask you a question. We just have a few more minutes left, Keith. So I want to ask you, um, given given what you experienced over in Germany from thirty three onward, with the, the the laws and the persecution of the Jews and so on. Uh, the growth of the, the how the gradual creeping of of fascism and how things became over time you know worse and worse and worse month by month year by year are there any anything any signs that you see that concern you at all it concerns me to hear that 11 Jews were killed in Pittsburgh but I wouldn't compare it in a way, but things can happen. You never know. We didn't think things are going to get that bad. And that's the danger. That right there is one of the dangers, right. where where you you ha you see there there are signs. There are bad signs, 
in terms of a growing amount of racism and anti-Semitism that you saw back then, that people kind of, um, oh, they just kind of blow it off, they deny it, they, they, they don't uh, consider it, and then all of a sudden it gets, it, it keeps getting worse and worse. Yeah. So what advice would you give to Americans today? Be vigilant. Pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on. And don't ever be a bystander. Don't let things happen to somebody else that you don't want to happen to you. Before we conclude our last segment with Gisela, I would like to share a quote with you that we should be kept in mind. And it goes like this. When they came for the socialists, I did not speak up because I was not a socialist. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. When they came for me, there was nobody left to speak. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.